Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Nightlight, a reminder that you are never alone. including all the Clarices out there, to what should be one of the more unique Nightlight episodes. I've actually met and had breakfast with our guest, Mark. No, Mark is not an alter ego or another personality. Mark Olshaker is an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker and author of several true crime books. His, his latest co-authored book just became available. It is entitled entitled The Killer's Shadow, The FBI's Hunt for a White Supremacist Serial Killer. Uh, you may also know him from his Mind Hunter, which became the Netflix, Netflix series. His website is mindhuntersinc.com, and Inc. is, like, uh, incorporated. Um, since Nightlight covers a lot of unusual history, uh, here is an even more, a little bit more background on the two marks. Uh, we met during the Friday conference at uh, the Twilight Zone 60 uh, convention where he was going to be speaking over the weekend. Um, yeah, but... Uh, uh, Mind Hunter and you know, Mark gave me his card. Like ne you know, next morning, Mark and his wife uh, were staying in the same ho hotel, and you know, they sat behind us at breakfast. Uh, then Mark Dweziak showed up so I could get an autographed copy of his Shawshank Redemption book uh, for our loyal listener, the Red Dragon Rider. And you know, Mark was over at the like you know, the uh, table with all the bacon and eggs and you know he's pouring the batter into the waffle thing and you know the griddle and you know, turn it over and get the waffle out and you know and I think uh, you know Barbara and the red dragon rider have uh, photos of, of of the breakfast and uh, uh, you know so there we have three marks at the breakfast and to make it even more Twilight Zone-ish, uh, my dear friends Helen and Johnny Holmes were sit sitting there too. So it, it, it was uh, a very unique <laughs> experience with this group. Um, so, yeah, I was going to get an, another copy of Mind Hunter uh, from Mark Oshaker, and you know, I couldn't uh, find his car. He got, you know stuck in the corner of the suitcase or something. I eventually found it when I got home. And so I had to have the front desk call him, call his room. And uh, then, then Mark realized that all of his books were in Anne's uh, trunk. And she was staying in another hotel. And uh, so I think Mark and I uh, 
to be profiled as incompetent serial killers. But that's a, a good thing. And uh, I can read a little passage here uh, that pertains to that. I also thought there was a high chance that being on the run, he would be too stressed and disorganized in his thinking to carefully plan to execute a bank robbery, which is a high-risk crime under the best circumstances. So there's some scientific profiling that Mark and I are good guys. Hi, Mark. How, How are, are you? you, Mark? <laughs> I'm, I, even I'm getting confused with all the Marks now. Yeah, I, 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 I know. It, it's... It, and also to uh, Mark, De, Mark DeWidziak and I also went to the same university, so uh, that makes it even more oh, okay. complicated. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, only something like this could happen at a Twilight Zone conference. <laughs> you know, I was listening listening to your intro. I was about hearing about all the cosmic stuff. I was thinking, gee, I'm not going to have very much that's cosmic to contribute. But I, I guess we're getting cosmic now, aren't we? Uh, you know, uh, um, I think this, your information is going to fit in somewhere between the UFOs and unicorns. Oh, okay. So that, that, that's... Um, well, I don't claim I think, to have seen either one, although um, <laughs> my uh, six-year-old great-niece is totally into unicorns now, so I guess uh, um, I've probably <laughs> seen uh, more episodes of uh, My Little Pony than most people my age. <laughs> okay, well, um, we're, you're never too old to learn something. So that, <laughs> I guess not. So we're going to, so we're going to be. Uh, uh, presenting a lot of uh, stuff we normally don't cover, but you have what uh, bring a compassionate view to um, crime, and, and that you know, does fit into uh, Barbara's mission statement for the show, but. You know, you know, since you know we can combine uh, here at the outset of the show with you know we met at the Twilight Zone conference and you, you know you do uh, have the prologue of your book is uh, taken from. The He's Alive Twilight Zone episode it was from one of the hour-long uh, uh, fourth season, third or fourth season episodes. Um, it, you know, that's a good uh, way to get the show started. So, uh, you know, you, 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 you've been friends with... Uh, the Serling family for a, a long time. You were a speaker at the conference. What you there's a story there. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about? Well, you 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 you've thrown you've thrown a lot of things at me, Mark. So let's see where will we, where will we start? Um, I um, I certainly consider myself a devotee of the late great Rod Serling. I was fortunate enough to know him well during the last 10 years of his life. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be dating myself here by, uh, by telling you approximately when that was. But um, I, and as going back as far as junior high school, when the uh, Twilight, for me, when the Twilight Zone was first on, uh, I was a huge fan, and I became a great devotee of Rod's, and it just so happened um, that at the, uh, that my mother, who was a teacher, uh, a public school teacher, an English teacher by trade, uh, was also volunteering for the 
local radio station at uh, American University. And uh, that was the really the beginnings of educational radio and television. This was this was really the precursor to uh, NPR. And at the time, uh, Rod was the president of the Academy of Television. Uh, motion picture arts and sciences, uh, the ones that give out the Emmy Awards, and eventually I was fortunate enough to win one, but let's go way back in time here. Um, so it turns out Rod was coming to Washington for something, and he was going to address the local chapter of the uh, Television Academy, and my mother, being in educational broadcasting at that point, uh, found out about it, and she brought me there, so I got to... Uh, I got to meet him, and it was, you know, this was like meeting my hero. I th I must have been, gosh, I must have been like 14 at the time. Uh, and wow. so, um, and when I got into the room, he it was a, at one of the big hotels, and it was one of the conference rooms, and he was sitting up there at the front table before it started with, my, with his brother, Bob Serling, who uh, was also a writer, an aviation writer. And I kind of timidly walked up to him and presented my paperback copy of Stories from the Twilight Zone and asked him to sign it. And uh, we engaged in conversation. And uh, and he was just couldn't have been nicer, more supportive. I mean, just generous. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know how many good things to say about him. Um, and then. Uh, he gave a speech. I'm, I think it was very inspiring. I don't remember much about the speech, but afterwards I wanted to talk to him again. But he and Bob rushed right out afterwards, and I didn't know. Any, I didn't understand why until the next day, when in the newspaper, uh, in Lawrence Laurent, who is the television critic of the Washington Post, his column said that he had gone right to the hospital after that, that he'd been experiencing chest pains, but he didn't want to disappoint the people uh, who were waiting to hear him speak, so he went to the hospital right afterwards. And I was very impressed that he still wanted to do it. I, I sent him a uh, I, I sent him a get well card in care of the hospital, and that, and I just figured it was a nice thing to do. And, oh, I would say maybe a week or ten days later, I got a letter back from him saying how much he appreciated it and how it was the best medicine and all of that. And frankly, Mark, that began our relationship, and I stayed in touch with him, and uh, I saw him a number of times over the years. And... Uh, he uh, he eventually I, he eventually got to read some of my early scripts when I became a professional writer and uh, I must say I was absolutely devastated when he died um, and I um, you know you mentioned Anne before his uh, younger daughter who has written a uh, biography of him and I you know Anne is mm -hmm. one of my Anne remains one of my closest friends so that's how I started with Rod and to tie it all together into a big bow here. Uh, he was a tremendous influence on me uh, and my writing. And um, I was very pleased that the book that I, we've just, I've just published with John Douglas, the FBI's uh, 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 behavioral profiling pioneer and the original mind hunter, uh, that we could start with an epigraph uh, from Rod Serling. And I want to bring it back to something else that you mentioned, Mark, which is writing about crime with compassion. And I'm really glad you brought that up because that really is what we try to do. I've written now, gosh, I don't know how many books with John, probably eight or nine at this point uh, on different subjects relating to criminal justice, profiling, behavioral science. And one thing we always try to do is say there are no Hannibal Lecters in the world as, uh, as glamorous a character as he is. The ones that we really care about are the victims. Uh, everything, everything that law enforcement does is for the victims. And that's where the compassion has to be. Um, so I'm really glad you, you brought that up. But um, if you want, um, since we're talking about the killer's shadow, which really is uh, unfortunately very relevant today in terms mm -hmm. of white supremacy and all that, perhaps I should uh, 
if you like, uh, and tell me if you don't, because uh, I'm <laughs> very easy on these things, perhaps I should um, I should read the epigraph, which is the opening monologue to sure. that Twilight Zone episode you mentioned, and yeah. then we can get into talking about the book. All right. Um, uh, it's about I think Den- was it a Den- was it Dennis Hopper I believe Mark who was uh, who was playing the part yeah it, it, yeah yeah Vol- uh, Peter Volmer yeah playing uh, a guy named Peter Volmer who is essentially a neo Nazi who's not he's he's kind of a loser he's down on his luck and um, not to give it away because the episode is sixty years old now but uh, the spirit of Hitler comes and advises him how to become uh, much more important. But anyway, let me read the um, let me read the the epigraph, uh, which was Rod's opening monologue. Portrait of a Bush League Führer named Peter Vollmer, a sparse little man who feeds off his self delusions and finds himself perpetually hungry for want of greatness in his diet. And like some goose-stepping predecessors, he searches for something to explain his hunger and to rationalize why a world passes him by without saluting. That's something he looks for and finds is in a sewer. In his own twisted and distorted lexicon, he calls it faith, strength, truth. But in just a moment, Peter Vollmer will ply his trade on another kind of corner, a strange intersection and a shadow land called the Twilight Zone. Now, why this is so so meaningful and, and so relevant to what I did was um, that Rod Serling, when this really prefigured the person I was writing about, uh, Joseph Paul Franklin, who was a, uh, for want of a better term, a white supremacist serial killer who in a three-year period from 1977 to 1980 killed 24, 22 people, um, uh, African Americans, mixed-race couples, and Jews, um, all because of his, uh, his twisted mind and his mission-oriented prejudice. He also, uh, many people might remember him as the one who wounded uh, Larry Flint, the publisher of uh, Hustler, and um, uh, Vernon Jordan, the uh, attorney and civil rights leader <clears throat> who just died a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this was a man who was completely filled with hate. Uh, it was his mission to start a race war. And unfortunately, even though he is dead, uh, his spiritual children live on. And I think that's what we've seen uh, in so many instances lately, whether we're talking about uh, uh, whether we're, we're talking about uh, Charlottesville in 2017, I believe it was, uh, whether we're talking about um, Dylan Roof in uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. Unfortunately, uh, Joseph Paul Franklin has many spiritual children today, and I think we have to understand that. And the more we understand it and the more we combat this, uh, this kind of hate and intolerance, um, the better off we'll be. And I might say parenthetically that uh, going back to what we were talking about before, I, I think this was, in Rod Serling's opinion and view, the the ultimate evil in the world was prejudice and discrimination against people just because of who they were or, or what they looked like. So uh, I hope the spirit of Rod has, has stayed with me through all of this. Yeah, um, I think the line that he wrote uh, perpetually hungry for want of greatness yes. um, fits into what Franklin really never got from home and what joining uh, you know, like uh, uh, the, the his brief stints in the Klan and other uh, white supremacist groups uh, seem to supply for him. But, I think know, you're absolutely right, way. Mark. Yeah, I, I, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, all of these people who claim to um, do what they do for um, 
spiritual reasons for missions uh, for the these are these are deeply inadequate people and uh, you know one of the things we were talking about the, on the phone before you mentioned to me mm -hmm. when we were preparing for this show was the uh, relationship between um, these kind of people and other serial killers who who probably who in in most cases kill for some kind of uh, sexual gratification or vicarious sexual gratification. But what we find is in all of these people, and we can be talking about white supremacists, we can be talking about um, we can be talking about uh, Muslim extremists, uh, the kind of people who carried out the 9-11 attacks. It, it doesn't matter who we're talking about. These are all people who find a deep inadequacy in themselves, and they're looking for something bigger, something to hang their hat on, if you will. Um, and so they look for an organization which can give them validity, uh, whether it's the Klan or, or whatever, and they are looking for some kind of validation through this. And one of the ways they get validation is to find people who they consider either inferior to them, like the Klan does and the American Nazi Party does with uh, African Americans, or people that they consider the enemy who are secretly manipulating everything, like the Jews. And Joseph Paul Franklin, who had never met a Jew in his life growing up in uh, rural Alabama uh, in the 1950s, he became convinced through what he read that uh, the Jews were controlling, secretly controlling the world. You've, you've heard all the tropes, the media, the banking industry, all kinds of things, and that the... Uh, black people were just their pawns and their dupes and that they were going and that uh, the powers that be were going to use them to replace uh, white people, which is something you still uh, hear today. I mean, one of the things that really struck me about, uh, and I've written about this in, in the toward the end of the book, in the uh, Charlottesville marches in uh, 2017, you heard uh, Two uh, two slogans being chanted by these torch-bearing skinheads walking to, marching down the street at night. One of them was "Blood and Soil," which was uh, one of the prime Nazi slogans, and the other was "Jews will not replace us." And uh, I think that shows that these uh, this kind of outlook is still with us. Uh, and one of the scary things is back in Joseph Paul Franklin's time in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, this was all kind of one-to-one. -one. You had to read books, you had to get pamphlets, that kind of thing. Now with the internet, God knows how many uh, sites there are where uh, this kind of uh, hate, conspiracy theories, uh, the you know, the QAnon type uh, things, and even much worse, are just uh, promulgated all over the place. Uh, and it's it's very difficult to control. Yeah, and you know, I do have a question you know, we can work in later about, uh, you know, computers, uh, mm -hmm. there's... Uh, so, so uh, uh, you, you know, when uh, John is getting the uh, behavioral sciences unit started in the, mm -hmm. you know, like late 70s, mm -hmm. uh, it, you, know, the, you know, there's like one computer in the off. You know, it, it's like it, it, it's not all that, yeah. it's nowhere near what it is today. No, it was a completely completely different kind of uh, kind of atmosphere and yep. uh, also a lot of these a lot of these theories were were untried uh, in a way mm -hmm. uh, this this the well the way the book starts actually is um, uh, Joseph Paul Franklin has been arrested in Florence Kentucky in 1980 but he's escaped and uh, there's great concern because uh, they believe that he's responsible for a number of these crimes. He's very dangerous. He's very mobile. He's been able to go all over the country uh, on his own. Um, and 
1976, he had written a threatening letter to uh, then-candidate Jimmy Carter, who is now president. And the uh, president was about to make a, remember this is 1980, the president was about to make a campaign swing through the South. And the Secret Service was extremely worried that with this guy on the loose, that uh, the president was a prime assassination target. Remember, Jimmy Carter was a Southerner who uh, promoted civil rights, uh, and so he was uh, he was considered by people like Franklin to be a traitor to his region and a traitor to his uh, class. So, what had happened? And his race. So, what happened was. As you say, the Behavioral Science Unit and the profiling program uh, at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, were in their very early stages. And uh, David Cole, who was the uh, director of the uh, Civil Rights Division of the FBI, called John in to headquarters and said, we've got this guy who's on the loose. and." We want you to do a uh, fugitive assessment of him, try to figure out, you know, we're going to give you all the information about him. You study his cases and try to figure out where he's going to be and what he's going to do. So this was kind of a make or break uh, uh, task and uh, assignment for John and uh, the small group of profilers at that point, because while they had uh, already done a number of important cases with uh, uh, with local police departments. This was the first time FBI headquarters itself had called them in to do a case. So, uh, and you know, this was not that long. Let's see, I believe J. Edgar Hoover died in 1972. So his long shadow was still uh, very much uh, uh, draped over the FBI. And, you know, that was sort of just the facts, ma'am. Uh, we, uh, we, we just do investigations. We, uh, we don't do this touchy-feely psychology stuff. So, uh, so the whole idea of behavioral profiling was, was still very much on the line in terms of whether it was going to be used as an FBI tool. It wasn't, you know, pop in popular culture. It wasn't a thing like it is now. So, uh, so uh, this was really uh, this book really goes back to the uh, the origins of the program. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think it, it, the killer shadow fits in with what Barbara and I want to do with the you know, looking at history, and you know we're uh, seeing a relatively recent how an aspect of recent history. E- evolving, and you know, a lot of us were you know, alive at that time, and we we remember it. You know, uh, we could get into the uh, Wayne Williams, um, mm-hmm. which was uh, just about at, at the same late, time, by the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, know, you had that going on uh, too, and you know, there's. Uh, a very interesting section about how he was caught, what mm-hmm. uh, some of John's tactics were to capture him. So, you know, hopefully, a lot of the uh, listeners are you know, starting to put, you know, recreate, uh, you know, what their childhood uh, st- seeing. What was linking all these different e- events at, at that time? I think you do yeah. a, a great job. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, and, and in a way, the um, Wayne Williams case that you refer to, uh, popularly known as the Atlanta child murders of uh, 1979, 80, and 81, that was kind mm-hmm. of the opposite of uh, the Joseph Paul Franklin case in a way because – You had, I mean, you had a city completely under siege in a way. You had all of these um, uh, African-American children and teenagers, um, mostly mostly boys, but but girls as well, uh, and they were disappearing, and then their bodies were being found later on, and this was an absolute horror. And, 
you know, cast your mind back to 1980. It hadn't been that long since, you know, this, the modern civil rights movement was at its height. And the assumption at the time was, this is, remember, and this is, this is Georgia, um, uh, which is, had been the scene of, of many, unfortunately, many lynchings over, over, over the decades. And the, uh, a lot of the people in town and, and as well as the police department were thinking, this is some kind of Ku Klux Klan type uh, operation where they are, they are killing our black children and they are, they are making a statement about this. And, jo- uh, and so it was going on. And as I say, you know, as you know, uh, this was a national story. Uh, the police chief, the mayor, uh, Maynard Jackson, who was the first black mayor of Atlanta, they were totally under siege uh, and to do something about this. And so reluctantly, uh, the Atlanta child, uh, the, the Atlanta uh, child murders task force called in John and uh, one of his profiling partners, Roy Hazelwood, asked them to come down and uh, consult on the case and look around. And once John and Roy uh, were taken to the sites where the kids had disappeared, they, by the way, these were all poor children. They lived in, uh, they lived in disadvantaged neighborhoods and uh, really ghetto type neighborhoods. And the first thing that John and Roy said was, "This is not the Klan. This is not uh, this is not that kind uh-huh. of political killing. In fact, this is not even a white person or white people who are doing the killing." And they said, "Well, how do you know?" And they and they said, "Well, look, we uh, we went to all the uh, we went to all the sites where they disappeared, and." we were the only white people there. I mean, we stood out uh, prominently like sore thumbs. And you have, uh, you have, you know, more than a dozen murders at this point in disappearances, and you don't have a single, uh, you don't have a single eyewitness to any of this. There's no way that a white man or even a woman could have been in these neighborhoods and not been spotted. And second of all, this is not the way the Klan or other hate groups operate. I mean, the whole idea of a lynching, the whole idea of all of those uh, uh political type killings was to create a statement uh, to take credit for it to create terror because that's what lynchings were they were domestic terrorism and nobody's claimed credit for it Uh, nobody has made any kind of public statement there's no ritualistic uh, uh, presentation of the bodies there's no communication nothing like that so um, we believe that um, for a lot of reasons which we could go into, but uh, we believe this is a um, single black male uh, who uh, has uh, a, who, who is doing this. Um, we think he is attracted to these uh, to these children and young adults. Um, he's he's personally uh, inadequate, so he can't deal with people his own age and uh, uh, the other thing they realized um, from previous uh, uh, cases and study of, of, and let's go back for a minute and say, <clears throat> all of this starts with uh, John and his partner, Robert Ressler, going uh, in the early 1970s and mid-1970s, just visiting prisons throughout the country and uh, interviewing uh, serial killers and other violent predators to kind of figure out what was going on in their thinking and try to correlate what was going on in their minds before, during, and after the crime. And that's certainly what the first season of Mindhunter uh, on Netflix, based on our, our first book together, John and me, uh, is, is all about. So one of the things that uh, they realized was that most of these killers, this kind particularly, would be following the news. Uh, would be following the news uh, very carefully, the media, and he could be manipulated that way. And so, mm-hmm. um, when they started announcing that uh, the medical examiner was finding uh, forensic evidence, hair and fibers and things like that on the body, 
John predicted, all right, he's going to take advantage of that. He's going to start throwing his victims into the river uh, so that they can uh, wash away uh, all of the evidence. And that's ultimately how they caught Wayne Williams, was <clears throat> they staked out all the bridges along the Chattahoochee River for about six weeks. And they didn't weren't really getting very far, but the last night of the stakeout is when they, uh, uh, one of the police cadets who was manning one of the bridges, he saw a car drive to the middle of a bridge on the uh, Chattahoochee, uh, heard something plunge into the water, and uh, saw this car come back, and that was Wayne Williams. Wow. Uh, it's little details like that that you you bring up in your book, and yeah, you know, we can get into more uh, later through the show. But it, it's fascinating reading about some of these observations that John made over just watching how people act. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and and you start putting these things together, and at first it seems like black magic. Well, how do you, yeah. uh, how do you, how do you, know, how do you know just from looking at a crime scene that the victim, that the uh, perpetrator is going to have a speech defect or a stutter, and uh, you know, and but then when you start working it out and uh, explaining where the logic comes from. Uh, you know, it makes it makes perfect sense, and I guess I've been with John enough over the years that I've uh, I've I've learned how to to do that too. Um, so I, I can give you an example if you want. Um, uh, years ago, uh, Mark Furman, who was uh, famous right. and notorious from the O.J. Simpson uh, case, he had a radio show uh, on in Spokane, Washington. And he used to like to have me on as a sort of a, uh, I guess, an expert, uh, uh, an expert guest on um, violent crime. And it so happened that at a certain point, and I'm not giving anything away because this was a number of years ago, so I'm not interfering with any ongoing cases. Uh, he, I was on the show, and the show was live, and he said, and they were having a string of serial murders in um, in in the Spokane area. And the victims were, I hate to say it, but kind of typical victims. They were prostitutes mo- mainly because unfortunately they're they're very approachable by uh, by bad people because they their business is to uh, take in strangers. So they this had gotten up to about fourteen or fifteen victims already and um mark said to me uh, he said well we've gotten some inside information from a source in the police department um and they say they have dna on nine of the uh they have dna on nine of the victims so what can you tell us about the uh, unknown uh, subject, the unsub, as we say, or the the unknown offender, from that piece of information I just gave you. So I started sweating. I said, "Gee, how how am I going to solve this one? Um, you know, just you got DNA on nine of them, and you want me to tell you, uh, and you want me to tell you what kind of uh, you want me to profile the guy just from that? So the killer. So I thought for a moment, and I said." Well, here's here's what I would say. Um, if you have um, uh, if if you have um, a uh, a killer who's this good at it, who's this adept, who is um, who is uh, getting away with these, he's not leaving blood on the scene. He's not he's not being injured enough to leave DNA in his blood DNA on the scene. So I've got to assume that um he is the the, the DNA is from uh semen. And you know I mean and prostitutes are very careful about uh not being um 
penetrated that way so that they uh, pick up any disease, get pregnant, etc. So um, a prostitute would not let uh, him uh, uh, deposit semen uh, on her or near her. So that tells me one thing. That tells me that he is going back to the, the body dump sites and he is masturbating on the corpses or in or having trying to have sex with them so what I would say is uh, the one thing I can say is your killer is a necrophiliac and the way you're going to catch him is uh, by going to the uh, by surveilling the crime scenes and eventually you're going to get him that way and sure enough that's what happened no, I mean, it's not. Okay. I, I mean, they would have gotten him anyway. It was. It wasn't that I came up with this idea. It's just that because of my experience with John and learning the way he thinks and learning the way profiling works, I was able mm-hmm. to work my way through the logical process. Yeah. There's. Um, oh, what was the? Oh, it, like. It, that that's very similar to the observations you and John make in Mine Hunter uh, with the discussion about um, where the uh, killer is strangling people but what he's really doing is acting out his own failed uh, suicide attempts by strangulation ah that's interesting yeah um, it, it, go on yeah uh, yeah I was gonna say uh, you know that's uh, get, getting pretty weird, uh, but you know, just one of your. <laughs> well, so, you know, you, well, you, I have to say, and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be flippant, but you got some pretty uh, weird people out there, uh, and uh, you know, I, when we uh, we talk about uh, people who most um, most of your listeners probably have heard of, like Dennis Rader, the BK, B, BTK strangler who uh, terrorized Wichita, Kansas for many years. Uh, that's just what he was into, uh, what, what is called autoerotic asphyxiation. He would practice, right. he would he would dress up in the clo- women's clothes of his victims and uh, strangle himself almost to the point of passing out and get an erotic high out of that. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was I guess you could say there was a certain amount of transference there because his preferred way of killing his victims was through strangulation, which is how he got the name, which, in fact, he gave himself uh, in anonymous uh, letters that he wrote to uh, the media because uh, he, you know, it's just like we were talking about with Franklin. These, to a serial killer, Whatever else is going on in his life, this is the most important aspect. This is the most important thing in his life. And so he wants credit for it. And uh, I'll say tangentially here, Mark, that you're almost always uh, going to hear me say he, and this is, this is not sexism on my part. The overwhelming majority of violent predators are men. Uh, I mean, you don't find, I mean, we can talk about uh, the few categories of serial killers where you do find women, but by and large, uh, they are men. Even though women might come from the same abusive, uh, really terrible background, they don't manifest it in the same way. Uh, They take it out on themselves and uh, are self-abusive rather than uh, striking out against other people by and large. It's... uh, you know, some people have said that uh, almost all violent crime is uh, is performed uh, by somebody on drugs and or on a drug, and that drug is testosterone. No, uh, um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it probably is the best explanation for why uh, you know, you you find much more male serial killers than women. Sure. E- e- easy explanation. Yeah, you know, besides you know, the 
you know, and women don't yeah. tend to be sexual predators in the same way that men do. Uh, I mean, that may, right. you know, part of that is biologically driven, but a lot of it is is in the head. It really is. No, and, and you know, besides, you know, the you know, a few really odd examples that we just discussed. You know, you, know, you also have observations like. Uh, uh, I had observed that orderly, compulsive people tended to drive darker cars. Okay, how, how do you figure that out? I'm sure Barbara well, drives it's, a you know, black I think car. it is it is it is observational, and I think uh, what it came down to is, and of course, this is not universal, but um, people who are obsessive, people who are very orderly meticulous uh, in, in other ways, very ordered in their lives, tend to be more serious people. And serious people consider darker cars more serious. Uh, it's just the way it is. They, they don't like, they don't favor sort of bright, happy colors. And then the other thing is, since we're getting into the whole automobile thing, what another thing that we have uh, which we can often tell from the behavior at the crime scene is if this is somebody who is, we can predict that they might be driving a, what we call a police type vehicle like Wayne Williams did. In the old days, it could be a Chevy Caprice, a Ford, uh, 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 Ford Crown Victoria, which was the, which was the favored car of police departments for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any sort of big American muscle sedan could be considered a police type vehicle. And these are people who who really a lot of them were police wannabes. They uh, had tried to become policemen, but couldn't. But they were. And this also goes to a lot of what's you know the current uh, public dialogue is about. But these people wanted to be po these got people we're talking about wanted to be police officers for all the wrong reasons because they wanted the power. Right. They wanted to con be able to control other people. It wasn't to serve the public. It wasn't to preserve the public's uh, safety. This was a manifestation of power. And you know, since we're talking, you know, on the day that the uh, Derek Chauvin trial uh, uh, ended in a in a guilty plea. I mean, I've never met uh, former officer Chauvin, and uh, don't expect to. Uh, but just looking at the tape over and over again, this was somebody who was really uh, seems to me was asserting his control, his dominance, uh, almost as. In, in a in a criminal way, it's like saying, "All right, in any any test of manhood between you and me, I'm the cop, so I'm going to win." And uh, this is uh, you know this is very close to uh, to criminal behavior in and of itself. Okay, and you have examples in your Mind Hunter where. Um, suspects uh, later in the interviews with them uh, that it became a pattern where what John was seeing that um, they wanted to be uh, police officers when they were mm -hmm. kids uh, mm -hmm. and, uh if something happened in the neighborhood, you know, uh, they were, uh, were probably the ones who did it, but you know, they, you know, would talk with the, mingle with the cops and ask them, mm -hmm. oh, do you have any, uh, you know, d descriptions of the perpetrator, you know, so, so, something like that. I, I, you know, you have all that Sure, you see that over and over again where a, uh, yeah. where a perpetrator tries to uh, interpose himself into the case, uh, becomes friendly with cops to, uh, uh, because he wants to be like them, and at the same time he wants to know what they know so that he can, uh, he can carry out his crimes. Uh, uh, you also, I mean, somebody like Joseph Paul Franklin, uh, uh, who we were talking about. I mean, he wanted to be uh, uh, he wanted to be a police officer too. Uh, his uncle, as I recall, had been a police officer in the South, but he had a serious. Uh, 
eye accident when he was uh, yep. when he was a, a young child. So, and so his vision was very poor in one eye, and they wouldn't accept him. So, what's very interesting is, um, uh, I'll give you another ex- I'll give you another example. Um, I have a good friend who also uh, has written a number of books of uh, about. Uh, about famous crime cases, whether it's O.J. Simpson or the John Benet Ramsey case, uh, his name is Lawrence Schiller, and uh, he's he's very he's also a very prominent photographer. Uh, Larry Schiller, when he was a young boy, had a serious accident that left him blind in one eye. Now, this is very similar to Joseph Paul Franklin. The difference is. Uh, Joseph Paul Franklin tried to compensate for this and did compensate for this by becoming an expert marksman. He became mm-hmm. a uh, he, he became really good. Uh, he could uh, he as a rifleman he became an excellent sniper. He could uh, he could hit a target with a telescopic sight from hundreds of yards away, which he did over and over again. Larry Schiller, on the other hand, compensated for his eye injury by becoming a photographer, um, a completely different kind of way of compensation. Uh, and it turns out he was, and he was in, was in a lot of the right places at the right time. And he had some very famous photographs. A lot of the photographs you've seen of uh, Marilyn Monroe coming out of the swimming pool. Larry took. Uh, Larry took pictures. Uh, uh, around the t- in Dallas, around the time that Lee Harvey Oswald was assassinated, uh, a lot of the pictures that you've seen uh, that you probably wouldn't even attribute to anybody, uh, Larry Schiller took. So, my point is, from the same kind of negative influence, you can go one way or the other. Um, another example is uh, Gary Gilmore, the subject of uh, Norman Mailer's uh, epic. Uh, Book, the Executioner's Song. He was the he was the first man executed for murder in the United States in 1977 after the Supreme Court lifted its uh, stay of executions. Um, he came from a very bad background. So did his brother Michael Gilmore, who became a very prominent uh, music writer and social critic for uh, Rolling Stone magazine. So, you know, you can go different ways. Uh, or here's another example. Um, as you as you mentioned on the phone uh, when we were talking before, uh, John and I wrote a book uh, about the Unabomber right after Theodore Kaczynski was uh, – was identified and uh, and arrested. Um, uh, Ted Kaczynski and his brother David had very similar um, backgrounds, and uh, they they both uh, had some family problems, some uh, antisocial problems. Both of them went away to live by themselves for a while, uh, um, as, and as you know. Kaczynski, the Unabomber, lived in a cabin all by himself. Uh, David lived in uh, in a cave, I think, in New Mexico for a while. And yet, um, Ted, who was brilliant, uh, became uh, a uh, public criminal, and David became a social worker. So they each manifested their experience in different ways. Yeah, and you, know, you do uh, when. You do get to the section of uh, of Franklin's um, growing up in a dysfunctional home. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, he made some wrong choices, mm-hmm. uh, but his uh, it, it, you also write. Uh, yeah, we see more cases of brothers raised under the same bad circumstances going in opposite ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, and, in his and, case, and um, in his in his case, uh, two brothers. Uh, I think his brother ended up in jail too. Uh, didn't not as not as a murderer, uh, but he also had two sisters who who turned out okay. So, you know. But I mean, look. There's no there's no doubt. Um, uh, Joseph Paul Franklin had a terrible upbringing. He was beaten by both his mother and his father. His father was a drunk. Um, it was, it was a terrible life. It was a, an, an impoverished life, and uh, he was always looking for a way out. So, I mean, I think the lesson here, Mark, is that 
almost all of the violent predators that, and offenders that we have studied had a bad background in one way or another. And usually, you know, constantly in our books, we're, we're talking about the uh, nature versus nurture uh, question and argument. And in most cases, with the kind of people we write about, the kind of offenders, it really is a combination of both. You've got somebody who is hardwired for... Um, impetuosity, for risk-taking, for maybe antisocial behavior as anger management problems. And then when you put him in this bad background um, and don't give him any positive reinforcement or he thinks the world is against him, uh, that's a recipe for, that's a recipe for danger. And, uh, you know, people all often ask John Douglas, uh, you know, can you tell somebody who, uh, as a, as a, uh, a school child who has the potential to grow up in this antisocial manner. And he says, yes, I can, but so can any good elementary school teacher. And he's right about that. Uh, so, you know, if there's no intervention at an early age, you've got a real problem. And as John says, you know, if you're waiting um, for people like me and police officers and detectives to solve your social problems, uh, by the time you get to us, it's too late. I mean, uh, all we can do is try to catch them and, and prevent them from doing damage. And I think one of the, uh, one of the themes that we, that we deal with uh, over and over again, Mark, is the idea that, yes, uh, if you have a bad background like that, it is understandable that you could have real psychological problems and that you could, for, to put it plainly, become a fairly messed up adult. But that doesn't mean that you are compelled to kill or hurt other people. That remains a personal choice. And so if there's one word that is probably as important conceptually as any other word we've ever written about, uh, that word is choice. They always have a choice about what they do. It what they do. No one's compelling them to do it. They're not um, compelled unless they are. You know, I would make the argument, um, and I don't think you would disagree, that anybody who kills in cold blood or for the personal satisfaction of it um, has is mentally ill on some level. But that doesn't mean that they are insane by the legal definition or incapable of controlling their actions. Uh, there is an old uh, saying, which I think we talked about in Mindhunter, uh, uh, a test called the policeman at the elbow. And the, and the question is, uh, if this person uh, who commits this heinous act, if there were a uniformed policeman watching, would he still be compelled to do it? And if the answer is no, then he can control himself. I mean, very few of the serial killers uh, that we have dealt with are what I would call insane or incapable of, uh, of controlling their actions. Now, every once in a while, <clears throat> you do get one who is, like Richard Trenton Chase, for instance, who uh, killed young women so he could drink their blood to stay alive. And... Uh, he honestly believed he had to do this, and when he was uh, when he was caught and put in prison, he would catch birds and kill them and drink their blood. So, uh, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of your listeners have ever tried to drink blood. I hope not, but it's really difficult to do. I mean, it will make you sick. It will make you throw up very quickly if you try to do that. So, somebody who had a compulsion to drink blood, whether human or animal blood, that's, that's somebody who's really, really out there. Okay. Um, and speaking of, of... I know we're jumping around a lot, Mark, but everything you say, you know, brings up another interesting topic. Oh, well, uh, um, okay. Well, it, it sounds like you think I'm doing a, at least a somewhat tolerable... Oh, you're, you're 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 covering the waterfront, no question. Okay, well, good. good. I, 
because I I don't want Barbara to uh, be making me uh, broadcast from Butte, Montana next week. So I read I read that part of your book too. Well, uh, I, you have to tell me. You've read it more recently than I have. What happened in Butte, Montana? Uh, uh, that was where uh, uh, your, your punishment was. If, uh, oh, oh, yes, if yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. All right. So I think uh, I think what you're referring to, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that uh, uh, as a if carryover from, from 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 J. Edgar Hoover's uh, yeah. uh, it, uh, time, which was went from 1924 all the way up to 1972 when he died. I don't think another uh, public servant or agency director ever had that long a tenure in the American government. But if you, uh, as an agent, screwed up or somehow uh, came into the disfavor of the director or one of the uh, assistant directors in Washington, um, you could find yourself transferred to the Butte, Montana resident agency, which was basically, you know, a, a one-room office in the middle of nowhere with uh, nothing to do. And uh, so that was, uh, yes, that was that was that was always one of the threats that was. Uh, Hanging over, uh, hanging over agents if they uh, were perceived to screw up. Yeah, like I don't know. Try to keep Barbara happy, so, <laughs> but but with um, you know, it, you know, we're dealing with Joseph Paul Franklin, but mm -hmm. that w wasn't even his real name. No, so, that's we, you, a good we, point you brought up. Uh, his real name was James Clayton Vaughn, Jr. He was born in Mobile, Alabama on April 13th, 1950. Um, so if he were still alive, uh, he would be uh, just, just 71. 71. Yeah. Um, so uh, at a certain point, um, he changed his name. Uh, and this will show you kind of how screwed up he was. He, tr he changed his name to Joseph Paul Franklin. Now, the Franklin was for Benjamin Franklin, who he considered a great patriot. The Joseph Paul was for Paul Joseph Goebbels, the, uh, the propaganda minister of the uh, Nazi regime in Germany, who he also uh, admired. So this gives you an idea of how misguided and screwed up this guy was. Um, and he, uh, his turning point really was when he was 16 and stole a copy of Mein Kampf, Hitler's memoir, from the local library. And uh, suddenly, uh, this was an epiphany to him. The world opened up to him. And he said, ah, now I understand how the world works. And he became uh, he became you know a Nazi, an anti-Semite. I mean, he all of the things around him, the black people around him, these distant Jews who he'd never met, um, came uh, became his enemies. And he started having a mission. And he joined a number of these hate groups. He joined the uh, he joined the Ku Klux Klan. He joined the National States Rights Party, which was an extreme right wing organization. He moved up to the Washington D.C. area and joined uh, what was then called the National Socialist White People's Party. Uh, then became the American Nazi Party, and. He found kindred spirits here. They all felt the same way, and they kind of encouraged and validated what he thought. But then something else happened, which is he was paranoid enough to realize that uh, that these groups were, a lot of them, infiltrated by the FBI, which in fact was true. They were. And... Um, he realized that a lot of these people were all talk. They wanted to talk about uh, how much uh, the, 
the black people were their enemies and the Jews were their enemies and how race mixing was going to be the uh, the decline and fall of this great white uh, country, the United States. Uh, but they wouldn't do anything about it. And so finally, he kind of leaves these organizations and he evolves into this missionary. And this, his mission is to create a race war in the United States to actually further through action the, uh, the, the goals that these other people were just espousing. And he becomes what we call a lone wolf. And, you know, you've seen other lone wolves over the years. And as I said, um, Dylan Roof, who, uh, who killed all of the um, uh, parishioners in the church in Char uh, and um, uh, uh, South in, in uh, South Carolina in uh, uh, 2015. Um, he was the same way. Uh, and what's very difficult is it's very difficult for law enforcement to distinguish between what we call aspiration and intent. In other words, people who made feel a certain way, but others who actually intend to do something about it. And what's interesting is um, when you have somebody like Dylan Roof, he had the exact same uh, goal as Joseph Paul Franklin, which was to figure that his act of violence would inspire a race war. And when he was tried in court and sentenced to, I think, life in prison in one case and death in another, in, in another trial, in his federal trial, it didn't worry him because he figured, just as Joseph Paul Franklin figured, that when the race war happened, uh, his people would take over and they would free him from prison. So this is the danger that we're facing. These people are true believers and um, they get to a certain point and they believe in what they do uh, and they don't even think about the fact that what they're really doing is compensating for their own inadequacies. Uh, what they've got uh, in almost every case, you've got two things um, warring within these people. Uh, you've got this deep-seated sense of inadequacy and uh, warring with that, competing with that, is this sense of grandiosity and entitlement that the rules don't apply to me and uh, I'm above all of that and I have a special mission and I have special entitlements that the world is not giving me. and. And that leads me to the triangulation of the uh, of the two uh, competing uh, sensations, which is this sense of resentment that uh, that society has not given them him what he wanted. It didn't give him the job it, he wanted. It didn't give him the riches. It didn't give him the women. It didn't give him the status or or whatever. And uh, so he decides to take it upon himself. And this will give and doing what he's doing will give him meaning. And, you know, on one level, this is obviously a very sick, perverse individual, but he was also very competent. He, uh, one of the reasons he was so difficult to catch is because he was highly mobile. He could, uh, he could find his way around the country easily. Um, he supported himself by robbing banks, which he was very good at. Um, but he was not, he was not, you know, what we call a criminal enterprise offender, somebody who commits crimes to enrich himself. Uh, this was just his way of, uh, supporting himself so that he could carry on his mission. Whenever he needed money, he would just rob a bank and, uh, uh, and, he was very good at it because he was so mobile. Also, uh, what was very difficult is for uh, one of the reasons he was so difficult to catch is he had more than one modus operandi. Uh, he was able. He had. He set off bombs. He killed people with handguns if, uh, at close range. He was a sniper who would pick off uh, people uh, f from hundreds of yards away. He would wait. He would sit and wait until he could uh, 
get somebody, whether it was um, a mixed-race couple uh, that he would find jogging in a park in Salt Lake City, uh, whether it was um, um, Jews coming out of a Saturday morning synagogue service uh, outside of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, he was he was very resourceful, and also he had. Um, he had a whole string of aliases, and uh, he would never use the same weapon twice. He would file off the serial numbers. He would get rid of them. So uh, this was somebody who was, um, while he his whole view of society was completely perverse, uh, and his relationships with people were horrible, this was somebody who was very criminally sophisticated. And you're talking about... Um or the race war happening. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, and let uh, me just Manson. say, let me let me oh. interject there, Mark. That uh, um, sure. he got his idea of the race war from Charles Manson, uh, and he mm -hmm. was a great admirer of Charles Manson, and he loved the fact. And you know, Charles Manson said that he wanted to create a race war, which he uh, you know dubbed Helter Skelter, uh, with his right. uh, with the two sets of murders in uh, Los Angeles in 1969. And what um, Franklin really admired about Charles Manson was that he could get other people to do his violent bidding just by inspiring them with his words. Uh, and so right. uh, this was something that was uh, a great talent as far as, uh, as far as Franklin was concerned. And he really hoped he could inspire others to carry out uh, his bidding and uh, follow his example. Yeah, and at this time in 77, 78, uh, uh, the Man, um, Manson family had been arrested. Most of them had been put on, been convicted. Right. There were a few. Uh, uh, Squeaky from was right. uh, still uh, doing some stuff before she mm -hmm. was eventually imprisoned. So, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, that was only uh, just a few short years before Franklin's heyday. That's right. And and you know, Manson uh, grew up down the street from where I'm sitting, uh, like 20 minute drive. Uh, it, it's not like the the Valley residents take uh, great pride in that. You, you just <laughs> yeah, you, you just hear hear about it. Uh, mm -hmm. The but um, we, since we are talking about uh, Man, the, yeah, the Manson. Uh, family and his, his uh, wayward philosophy um, you know, there there is an interesting difference uh, like with the opening of your book you know, it's, uh, Franklin is shooting from uh, a telephone pole uh, few hundred yards from mm -hmm. a synagogue as uh, the uh, family and uh, participants for, from the bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah come out after the uh, ceremony. It, uh, you know, the Manson uh, family murders, uh, those were done up close and yeah. personal. Yeah, you can look at yeah. Jack the Ripper. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so what do these uh, like long distance uh, snipers like you know, Dirty Harry and mm -hmm. the, the uh, like uh, intimate murders like you know, Jack the Ripper or uh, uh, I forget which one uh, uh, you know, killed uh, Sharon Tate. Yeah. But, you know, well, those you know, close. Yeah. Um, uh, of course. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting question, and these are different type of people with, with different aims. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Manson was able to convince these uh, kids, most of them, you know, pretty middle class, as I recall, 
um, to do his bidding and uh, you know to come under his power and uh, you know it's it's hard to account for uh, people who would do that kind of thing but clearly they were looking for some kind of connection and bought into uh, his vision uh, what's interesting is the difference between somebody like Manson and somebody like Joseph Paul Franklin is um, you know Franklin really had no other uh, outlet. I mean, he grew up in a miserable situation and found Hitler when he was 16, and this was sort of determined his life. Um, Charles Manson, on the other hand, he just wanted to be prominent. He wanted influence. Uh, he really wanted to be a rock star. And if he and had he been had more success, as you probably remember, you know he was hanging out with the Beach Boys for a while and and uh, mm-hmm. and others. And but he was he could never make it as a rock star, and so he became a star in other ways. And uh, you know, had uh, it sounds perverse to say, but had Charlie Manson made it as a rock star, the Tate LaBianca murders never would have taken place. He wouldn't have felt the emotional need but it was very important to him to have control to be prominent to be looked up to and in fact what's very interesting is uh, you probably know that Manson was very diminutive physically uh, he was probably right. less than five five and when uh, when John went to interview him uh, in prison first thing Manson does when he comes in is uh, he climbs up on the table and sits on the back of a chair so that he can be up higher than John and uh, his partner, Bob Ressler, so that he could – it was almost like he was still preaching to his uh, his congregation, if you will. And, uh, you know, while John did get some uh, some insights from him, he was still so interested in preaching and spewing all his – crazy radical ideas that um, you know he really wasn't much of a subject in terms of giving insight into why people commit the crimes and uh, and uh, John really felt that it was all about influence and power with uh, with Manson it wasn't that he got any kind of sexual gratification from these crimes uh, he <clears throat> he really thought that if he couldn't be a rock star he could create this social movement through helter skelter and I think the fact that he got these women you know we were talking about how women don't commit violent crimes the fact that he could get these women to do these horrible things and you know I've seen the crime scene photos from the Tate and LaBianca murder scenes and they're just horrible and uh, you know the fact and I guess all of the Manson family members who are still in prison and alive today they've they've seen the error of their ways but I mean what they did was so depraved so so horrible that it's it, it's hard to find, you know, any forgiveness for them. Yeah, and uh, you and know, you and John do write about. Uh, you have to feel sorry for the way some uh, Franklin, for example, was uh, brought up. But sure. like you said, it was his choice. Uh, mm-hmm. Most of these people only show remorse that they were caught you cover that absolutely in mind, you, you, again you've hit the nail on the head mark uh, they they have remorse but only remorse for themselves for being caught yeah and when franklin was in jail you know he he did uh brag to uh, some of the inmates oh, i uh, you know, knocked off this guy and you know who are but uh, he he was really very reluctant to uh, a- admit his involvement in the shooting of Vernon Jordan. That right. you know, he failed. Right. He, There's he two couldn't. things there. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one is he failed, and uh, he considered. Uh, I mean, the fact that Jordan almost died and was in the hospital for a long time. This. This was not a clean kill, so he did fail. Also, Jordan was a very prominent um, 
uh, African American uh, civil rights leader, and um, and Franklin was in Marion Federal Penitentiary, and uh, you know as soon as he was sent to prison, um, a bunch of uh, the black inmates knew who he was, and uh, they attacked him with uh, with knives and razor blades, and he was almost killed. So uh, he he was very aware of the fact that uh, he was persona non grata amongst a lot of the prisoners. So this was one that he was, uh, um, though he did finally uh, kind of admit it, uh, this was one he was not anxious to have uh, attached to him. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the things that's very interesting about him in the in in the book and in his later life in prison is he started admitting and calling various police departments and admitting to crimes that sometimes he was suspected of, sometimes he wasn't, but that hadn't been tried for lack of evidence. And there were two things going on. One of the things is he said he wanted to get out of uh, Marion Federal Penitentiary because he felt so threatened there and wanted to go into uh, a state prison instead for one of his uh, state crimes. Um, but the other thing is, uh, like so many of these people, like uh, like the BTK Strangler and all that, you know, this was his life's work. So he really wanted the recognition too, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's sick again. But uh, again, if this is your life's work, if this is the most important thing in the world to you, the, this is your raison d'etre, if you will, then uh, he wanted the credit for it. He uh, he said to one of the, the newspaper reporters that interviewed him that he wanted to be, uh, uh, he wanted to rack up the most uh, uh, capital crimes uh, uh, convictions of anybody in the country. I mean, it sounds weird, but, uh, you know, these are, <laughs> as we know, these are not normal people. Right. And you know, th throughout you know, the killer's shadow and uh, mind hunter, and speaking of uh, you know the sick need for attention, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, John, uh, you know, we uh, went over the example where John was uh, telling the media how to, uh, uh, you know, where we're going to. Uh, catch uh, Wayne Williams, but you know, mm -hmm. like going to the uh, uh, river. But it, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, the media seems to be used uh, 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 in a lot of these cases. Uh, you, you can get back to Jack the Ripper and you know, the threatening letters to the. Uh, Newspapers and the police departments, and uh, you know, how how is like social media uh, being used uh, to today? It, is like it, it, is that like almost a whole new, co completely different world in itself? Well, it is. It is, and it isn't. And you you know you've brought up a, a, you you've brought up a, a topic with several interesting dynamics to it. If you want to go back to Jack the Ripper, which is, you know, yeah. generally considered one of the first um, serial killer cases, uh, East End of London in the summer of 1888. And of course, the media, the newspapers jumped all over this. I mean, this was just an incredibly big story, a huge story. And, um, what we believe is, you know, and we've looked at all the evidence. I went to Scotland Yard. I went through some of their files. I talked to a number of their um, um, detectives, and uh, we tried to figure out what the police knew and, and when they knew it. Um, and, you know, I actually became convinced, and we've written about this in our book, The Cases That Haunt Us, uh, that um, the police at the end really did know who Jack the Ripper was. Uh, so we believe, you know, we believe we identified him. Other people have, you know, disagreed or have other, uh, other uh, ideas. But the, even the term, uh, the name Jack the Ripper came from a letter that was written to um, the police, I believe. And, um, 
let's see. Um, I can tell you who is. I've got the cases that haunt us in front of me here. Let me look is it up. Is that the Polish? Uh, do, do you think it's the Polish yeah. immigrant living? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, this was this is what's called the Dear Boss letter, and it was written to the London Central News Agency. So it was written to the media, and uh, and it's and it was signed Jack the Ripper. We don't. We don't believe that the letter, if you analyze it, both the handwriting and what we call the psycholinguistic analysis, we don't believe this was written by the kind of person who Jack the Ripper would have had to have been. We think this was written by a member of the press, (coughs) a member of the media at the time who was trying to gin up uh, readership. Now, there was another letter that came afterwards. uh, the, Is that the uh, and from, from hell, the from the, hell letter. Yeah, the from hell one. Yeah, and that we believe was written by Jack the Ripper, but uh, the re- the real offender. But that is much less coherent. The handwriting is worse. Um, it's uh, it it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And we believe this guy was a very sick individual. But you know, I would say that the guy who uh, who wrote the Dear Boss letter that uh, be, you know gave the name Jack the Ripper, I think was um, you know was a pretty sick manipulative individual himself. But you know then we come all the way up to the present with social media, and you know as we've said the internet puts a whole new spin on things. Um, and let me give you an example. I mean I started my journalistic career. Um, working for the Washington Bureau of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper. And I cover, and I was on the team that covered uh, events like the uh, fall of Saigon uh, from Washington, of course, uh, and, um, and mainly uh, uh, Watergate and Richard Nixon's uh, fall from grace um, and all of that. And... I get asked from time to time, you know, by college students who are writing papers, well, what's the difference between uh, the war- the Nixon era, um, when we had a very unpopular, controversial president, and the Trump era, when we had an v- unpopular, controversial president? And I think the main difference, and this will, I think, get to the heart of your question, Mark, is that... In the Nixon administration, and during the time of Nixon in the 1970s, we had three major networks. We had newspapers in almost every big city, sometimes two newspapers. Uh, They all got their news initially from the Associated Press, United Press International, Reuters, places like that. And basically, you know, people had different political views but everybody was sort of consuming the same news. Everybody kind of agreed on the facts of what was happening in Vietnam, what was happening in the streets, what was happening in the ghettos, what was happening in government, whatever. You may disagree on the interpretation or whether that was a good or bad thing, but, every, but because of the news media every, and the way things were then, everybody kind of shared the same reality. Today, that's not true anymore. Uh, During the Trump administration, you know, you have, we have two separate realities, whether it had to do with COVID, whether it had to do with immigration, whether it had to do with, you know, anything you can think of. Uh, There were at least two separate realities, each of them fed by uh, their their own uh, cohorts. I mean, you have CNN and MSNBC on one side, you have Fox News on the other, uh, you have right. all of these conspiracy theories now, you have QAnon uh, and all of these others. So everybody's got a different reality now. So I think that's the reason it's so difficult for uh, for us to make sense of what's going on now, because you know we don't even agree on the facts anymore as, as a nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I, you know, I, I, and I, and I think, you know, all of, the, and that's so that's the internet, and I think social media uh, feeds that because it picks up on that, and 
you know, I don't understand exactly how uh, Russia was supposed to have uh, uh, influenced the uh, 2016 election, but clearly a lot of it was through social media. So, um, you know, uh, that is uh, that that is a real issue, and people, you know, who have the same thinking as Joseph Paul Franklin now can find kindred spirits very easily anywhere, anywhere, and you know they want. Right. No, I, I, I think those are a very valid point. I, you know, just there. You, you can just sit there and look at uh, social media, and it, you know, they're just it, it's a lot of groupthink. You know, you, mm-hmm. Now, I'm not. I, I, I I'm on Facebook. Um, um, at my age, I'm not real adept at social media. Uh, I'm. I, I don't do Twitter, but I understand that's very influential. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you can see the evolution of thought, the part, uh, partitioning of, of America. Just, mm-hmm. Everyone just kind of joins the kindred spirits, and yeah. you have uh, uh, you know, tw- twenty and different I, and I theories. And I think you know to pick up on what you're saying. I think one of the strengths and great liabilities of the internet is whoever your kindred spirits are, you're going to find them there. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I, I, I just uh, find what you and John have written about uh, to be just really thought-provoking. And okay, so you know, kind of you know, work in uh, you know, an aspect of. John's uh, in the, the importance of the uh, behavioral science units it, in the late 70s it was a fledgling organization and just kind of get that science of yeah. Williams quote in there uh, mm-hmm. but uh, you, know, you know you do uh, discuss that uh, Thomas Harris uh, who consulted with John a a, a yeah. lot, but uh, he, you know, he, uh, John seems to have been the pattern for Jack Crawford. Yeah, well, you know, look, well, let me back up a minute and say that okay. clearly it was Thomas Harris and uh, and his two books, Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs, that we have to thank for the popularity of, um, of uh, or even the awareness of profiling and behavioral science in popular fiction. Now, what's ironic about this, Mark, is that what John and his colleagues did uh, and, and figured out really was prefigured by the popular fiction of the previous century. If you go back and say, well, where does profiling really start? Fascinatingly, it starts with Edgar Allan Poe and uh, mm-hmm. uh, his his detective um, C. Augustin Dupin and the murders in the Rue Morgue and stories like that and Wilkie Collins and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and with Sherlock Holmes. These are really the original profilers. And so what evolved in the 1970s in, at the FBI really was a case of life imitating art. And then, of course, you come full circle, as you've mentioned, with Thomas Harris, who became fascinated by this. And, uh, and, and so we really have come full circle. And even though there's a lot of aspects of Silence of the Lambs and Red Dragon, which aren't uh, that realistic, you're, you're very right. I mean, t- uh, Jack Crawford was the first character uh, who was based on John Douglas. There have been many others since uh, the, uh, the two um, 
leads uh, Mandy Patinkin and then uh, Joseph Montaigne in uh, the CBS uh, series Criminal Minds, which has been very popular. They're all based on John. Uh, uh, Patricia Cornwell has a character, an FBI agent based on John. Of course, the character um, of uh, Holden Ford in uh, in our Mindhunter series is based directly on John. And I have to say, this is how I came into uh, the whole enterprise. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, um, I've spent a lot of my, though I've written both novels and nonfiction books, I've spent a lot of my career uh, as a documentary filmmaker, mostly for PBS. And um, I have um, I had been working for the PBS science series, Nova. I'd done a couple of shows uh, for them with my producing partner, Larry Klein, who's still one of the top uh, science producers in the, in the PBS system. And um, I remember coming to uh, uh, Nova is, uh, is produced out of WGBH uh, television in Boston. And I remember going up there and talking to Paula Apsell, the executive director, and I said, look, here's what I think we ought to do. Um, there's this uh, book I've read, a novel called The Silence of the Lambs, which is really a great book. It became a bestseller. They're making a movie out of it, and if the movie is anywhere near as good as the book, um, I think it's going to be a big hit. I mean, I didn't know how big a hit it would be, but I said, look, I think what we ought to do is, I think it would be a really interesting show if we did a show about... Uh, the real story behind Silence of the Lambs. In other words, go to these profilers in, at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, follow them in cases, and do a film about what it's really like. Um, and so eventually she agreed. We called the FBI. Um, it wasn't a big thing then, so they were happy for the publicity. This was before 9-11, so uh, the... Uh, it was in the 90s, so that uh, security was not nearly as tight, and they welcomed us in. And so we uh, we followed um, John's unit. I got to m met him and became uh, friendly with all the other profilers. We we looked at cases and finally found a case that we wanted to focus on. Uh, we ended up uh, producing a film called. Um, Mind of a Serial Killer, uh, for which was on PBS, and uh, it was nominated for an Emmy. It did very well in the ratings. Uh, actually, the Behavioral Science Unit uh, started getting more requests for their services every time the show was aired on PBS. And in any event, uh, uh, so where I come into the story again is uh, I get a call. Uh, the show is on, and that's that, and I go back to my real life and uh, produce, uh, I'm producing other films, and I get a call from John Douglas, and he said, listen, I'm getting ready to retire. Um, do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And uh, if they are, would, would you like to write it with me? Uh, would, would you work with me? And I said, well, I think it's fascinating. Let's, you know, let's see. And so I called my agent and he was interested. We went to New York. Uh, we did. A, I wrote a proposal. We we did a presentation. Um, probably one of the smartest things I did was come up with the title Mind Hunter, um, and um, which was just luck on my part. And uh, we got good offers. We ended up going with Scribner, a, par, a division of Simon and Schuster. Uh, the book became a big bestseller, and we just kept going from there. So, um, you know, it's funny how these things happen. Um, you know, it sounds the way I'm talking like my career has had some, you know, intentional arc, but it really hasn't. I mean, I set out to become a uh, uh, an independent writer, and, you know, I kind of took whatever came along next, and uh, it's turned out to be an interesting adventure. It, 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 um, you, know, you and John wrote in uh, Mind Hunter that uh, uh, just a, a, as a kid, he was basically uh, yeah, good, 
good guy, but uh, really didn't have much direction. And his... You talking you know, about John? Yeah. Yeah. And no, he 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 actually he wanted to um, he wanted to be a veterinarian, uh, but yeah. his uh, his grades weren't good enough to get into vet school. Yeah, and his real first profiling job was being a bouncer, looking at people's that's fake right. IDs and mm -hmm. stuff. Like that's that. right. That's it, right. Yeah, there's there, there, there's hope for me yet. <laughs> But you know he he said um, you know he used to he, back when he was still hoping to be a veterinarian uh, he used to go up and work on farms in upstate New York during the summer and uh, he said uh, and and maybe this was one and this was actually one of his first profiling uh, observations too and he could never figure out how cows could get through the fence um, uh, or uh, and 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 just roam free, and then he just he said he spent a whole day watching cows at the fence, and he said, I suddenly realized that if you're a cow and you want to get to the other side, and you got nothing else to do all day other than you know chomp on grass, um, he says, if that's what you're interested in, you'll figure out a way to get through. And so, you know, I think uh, I think there's a profiling lesson there too, which is, if that's what you're interested in, whatever it is, you'll figure out a way to get it done, even if it's, you know, even if it's a crime. Uh, and as, as as you alluded to earlier, Mark, I mean, a lot of these criminals who turn out to be, you know, really deviant sexual criminals start out with very simple um, offenses, whether it's uh, being a peeping tom or slipping into a, um, an empty house and stealing personal items uh, from women like uh, underwear or jewelry or even photographs uh, on their dressers and you know and then as they get bolder and bolder and see that this works uh, for them and they don't get caught uh, they escalate and and they evolve I mean, very, very few of very few of these uh, sexual predators start out, you know, as rapists or murderers. They they evolve as they as they learn and they get better. Uh, I hate to use the word, but they get they get better at what they do. And from all of the observations that were done with Franklin interviewing mm -hmm. Manson, um, mm -hmm. Gilmore, uh, Richard Speck, uh, um, you know, there, there uh, was produced the uh, John and what, what several others mm -hmm. wrote the crime classification manual. Manual, and yeah. Yeah, and that that became a very important uh, book in under yeah you know, helping to solve these crimes. Yeah, and also and also f figure out what you were looking at. I mean, mm -hmm. most people are are familiar with the psychiatric uh, handbook, which is uh, referred to as. DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, and I think it's now in its fifth or sixth edition, so it's DSM-5 or DSM-6, and that was, you know, and that was important, and, uh, and it's an important book for psychologists and psychiatrists and those who want to understand the mental illnesses, but John and his colleagues realized that in behavioral science, using those kind of psychiatric terms really were not going to be helpful in solving crimes. I mean, in other words, if you say someone is a paranoid schizophrenic with uh, antisocial or asocial uh, tendencies, I mean, 
that doesn't really help you much uh, in terms of who are you looking for, what kind of person uh, could have committed this crime. So what they tried to do was classify crimes according to motive and what was trying to be accomplished and the type of person who would commit these crimes, uh, whether it's a personal cause homicide, in other words, you do it because of something within you, whether it's a group cause, something that we would like the Klan might do, uh, criminal enterprise, which would be essentially like robbing a bank or robbing somebody for money or something like that. And they decided they better start using terminology that was useful to a detective. So instead of using terms like schizophrenic or antisocial or borderline personality disorder, they, they broke it down into things like, is this an organized killer or offender or a disorganized killer? Or is there a mixed mm -hmm. presentation? Because each, uh, each uh, aspect of it will tell you something about the person. Uh, if it's very disorganized, you're going to know this is a person who probably doesn't have a good job. He may not have a car. Uh, he, so he may not have um, um, much money. He probably lives close to the scene. Uh, things like that. If it's organized, uh, that will tell you some other things about him. So, you know, you build on all of these things, uh, and then you start uh, learning enough from experience uh, and from the interviews to be able to start talking about, well, what's the age, uh, what's the race of the person, uh, what kind of job does he have, as you say, what kind of car does he drive, has he been in the military likely, uh, has he been married or is he in a personal relationship, <clears throat> Does he live alone? Does he maybe live with an older relative? All of these things can be discerned, uh, not necessarily proven, but they can be discerned from a lot of the behavioral evidence that's left at the crime scene. For instance, is the body, I mean, are there a lot of, is it, has there been a lot of stab wounds? Is there disfiguring of the face? Uh, is it a, is it, you know, a kill from a long way away, like, John, uh, Joseph Paul Franklin, is the body covered up? Uh, does the body, does the person seem to have been killed at that site, or was the body transferred somewhere? All of these are behavioral clues which can let us start making some conclusions about um, the uh, the offender. Now, there's the cliche that you know, it's an asocial uh, white male uh, in his mid-20s to early 30s, and he's nocturnal, and he doesn't dress well and all of that. But, you know, that's kind of superficial stuff. That doesn't really tell you much. What you're looking for is really uh, elements that give you a more profound insight into what this person's like, and just as important, what is he likely to do? Or, you know, we talked about media before. Um, John has always said that the media can be one of a uh, detective or investigator's best friends because if you can put out a profile, if you can start telling uh, people through the media what kind of person this is, what kind of behavior you would expect, uh, and say, and in some cases he would even go so far as to say, and this person has told somebody close to him what he's done. And that person is now in danger because he knows too much. So that person ought to come to the police and get him and protect himself. And, you know, that kind of thing often leads to uh, somebody turning somebody else in. But what you're looking for is you're looking for you're trying to give out enough characteristics without giving away you know, things that the police don't want given out, you're saying, here are characteristics that um, this person is uh, likely to display uh, now that the crime has been committed, and people close to him will recognize this. Um, that worked in a case in Seattle where uh, a young man was uh, um, was uh, setting fire to uh, arson, uh, setting arson fires to synagogues uh, it turned out he was Jewish and uh, he was uh, and his father turned him in after recognizing these traits that were uh, that were that were publicized so you know uh, 
media can strike both ways. I mean, it can uh, it can hurt a case, but it can also help a case if the uh, if the detective or the uh, law enforcement officer uh, knows how to use it. And that doesn't and, mean and that and that doesn't mean manipulating uh, the media. It just means putting out information that other people can recognize. Okay, and you know, Mark, we're down to about ten minutes, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, well, the time goes by, doesn't it? Oh yeah, I. Uh, I, I was just happened to glance at the clock, and I. I Thought we probably had about about another fifty minutes left, but um, <laughs> uh, but you know we've uh, spoken a lot about you know the uh, murderers and you know this is a uh, you know I've had uh, one friend uh, look at you know the banner and they're like oh, oh you know uh, I love the CSI shows but uh, the topic's kind of creepy, you know, so you get that like sure. attraction, repulsion type. Oh look, uh, I've, yeah, I've, I've got to tell you, Mark, I've I've had friends who uh, who said, "Well, I read the first paragraph of your book, and I it was <laughs> I I couldn't get any further than that." And you know, I accept that this is this is not for everybody. This is uh, you know, I think one of the reasons it's important to us, and one of the reasons which we think that true crime stories. Um, are so popular and have such staying power is this really is about the human condition, but it's the human condition writ large at the extremes. It's it's really about why people do the things they do, and uh, and that's really the essence of life. So all of the things we all experience, all the emotions, whether it's love, hate, revenge, resentment, jealousy. Uh, pride, shame, whatever. These are these are all the elements of of true crime, but writ large and at the extremes. I mean, most of us, uh, whether we feel these emotions, we can control ourselves. The people who don't are are the ones that we uh, write about and their victims. And I think, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, I hope we give people more of an understanding of that that human condition through what we write. Yeah, and you know, since you just brought up the victims, uh, you know, one of the points I wanted to make uh, before the show wraps was, you, know, you and John uh, do write early on in the Killer Shadow. This was the most gratifying part of the job, helping bring justice to those victims and their families. You know, Absolutely, we personalized and glorified the victims. Uh, yes, too often. Uh, you know, all, all the attention goes to absolutely you know, the, the, a, a murderer, but the, uh, the, 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 the criminal it, is never the hero ever. And yeah. uh, and you know, even though some people put themselves in risky positions, we want to stress it's never the victim's fault. I mean, all this business about well, she was asking for it or you know whatever. No, never ever. Um, nobody, nobody deserves to be the victim of a crime under any circumstances. Yeah, and, and it, that does sh show through in your works as well. And uh, and let me just say, I'm sorry oh. to interrupt, Mark, but let me just say, uh, John and I have also become uh, very close emotionally with the families of a number of uh, of murder victims, um, and. I think one of the reasons is, well, certainly, you know, we approached them because uh, we wanted to write about their cases and wanted to uh, learn about them and, and learn about, you know, the real personality of the, of the, of the person who was, was killed. But I think one of the reasons we've been able to do that is because we realize that these are complete human beings. They are, they are more than just the tragedy that happened to them and the fact that we can deal with them on that level, I, I, I think they relate to, and which is why, you know, I have to say so many of our close friends now are are the families of murder victims. You know, um, you know it's just a, uh, interesting how trauma brings 
uh, people together. Yes, and absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, um, do you want to uh, promote your website and where people can? Get yeah. Well, I mean, the web the website we uh, it's mainly informational, but the website is mindhuntersinc dot com. M I N D H U N T E R S I N C dot com. Our the uh, the company that John and I formed to uh, write these books and do consulting is called Mind Hunters Incorporated. So that's where that comes from, and um, all of our books from um, Mind Hunter up through uh, Journey into Darkness, Obsession. Uh, I'm trying to remember them now, all in order. Uh, the Anatomy of Motive, uh, the cases that haunt us. Uh, uh, Law and Disorder, the killers, the killer across the table, and now the killer's shadow are all available on Amazon and at your local Barnes and Noble or other bookstores. We also promote independent bookstores, so wherever. And they're also uh, uh, most of them are, in, are available as they're all available as Kindle. Most are available as audio books. And he, here's an interesting thing: um, our last book, uh, The Killer Across the Table. The audio book was done, uh, was was read by Jonathan Groff, who played the John Douglas character on uh, uh, on Mindhunter. We got him to do it. The Killer's Shadow is uh, is uh, read by Holt McCallany, who uh, plays the other uh, FBI agent on Mindhunter. So uh, they became good friends of ours, uh, the two actors, and uh, and we love the reading that each of them did for for those two books. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe just a qu quick question. I still mm -hmm. have uh, page, pages full of uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we could uh, just kind of wrap up uh, with an easy question. Uh, okay. Tie everything together. Uh, you know, in the the killer shadow, it. it uh, you know, we know early on who the subject is. Yeah. Uh, it's not your typical whodunit where we find out the last uh, couple minutes that Norman Bates was the killer of Spin right. Psycho or the last page of an Agatha Christie novel. But is your ability to keep the story going, you know, the audience knows who, who the bad mm -hmm. guy is, but it is... You know, introducing more information and you know, keep keeping the reader spellbound. Is that some of Rod's influence on your writing? I sure writing? hope so. I think so. Um, first of all, I mean, his com tremendous compassion for humanity and uh, and looking for all the dimensions of how people live, not just top people and uh, you know some in some cases the mystery is what's important um, trying to figure out uh, who did it uh, in the book we're writing now uh, which is going to be called when a killer calls I'm 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 writing it right now uh, be out sometime later this year or early next year um, the mystery really is who did it um, we kind of know why but who did it um, in this case we know from the beginning who did it, and the question is why and how, mm -hmm. and what can we learn about other people, uh, other killers, and also what does this tell us about our own society? So, you know, I think you've 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 hit on a uh, sort of a major uh, point of of the craft, which is what are you what are you looking for when you write and i have a very simple formula for all of my writing which is if i can get the uh, reader to want to know what happens next no matter where you are in the story if you want to know what happens next then i've succeeded and so um you know, I think a lot of what we talk about is the analysis. I think one of the reasons our books have been successful is because we show how the profiling program works. I mean, we're not giving away anything that's going to help uh, criminals. We've proven that over and over again. But just to give an insight into how it all works, how you build a profile, how you follow it, how you interact with local police and detectives, that's all uh, 
that's all part of the story. So if I can keep my readers interested, um, you know, that's all I'm look. That's that's what I'm looking for. Uh, you do a great job at that. Okay, well, so we're you. down to uh, seconds. So uh, yeah, you know, I just uh, I want to tie things in like Rod did uh, did in his uh, Twilight Zone. So uh, you know, a- end up with uh, uh, Clarice. How the waffles stopped cooking. So. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Mark. Uh, Thanks, uh, Barbara, for uh, producing the show, and we'll see everyone Sunday night. Thank you. Good night.